this so it's working now it's there yeah 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 okay okay uh great uh so welcome everyone uh to our e-seminar series for uh translational biomedical engineering uh today uh we have the privilege to have uh, Dr. Massimiliano Paganelli uh, from uh, University of Montreal uh, and the CEO of MorphoCell Technologies with us, who will be talking about his uh, uh, career experience uh, from, from a researcher to an entrepreneur. Uh, so before we start uh, this uh, uh, talk today, uh, I would like to make a few uh, housekeeping uh, announcements. Uh, the first, uh, first of all, as, as usual, uh, this YouTube, uh, this uh, 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 talk will be uh, recorded and posted on our YouTube channel. Uh, you can uh, follow us, subscribe to, uh, on, uh, to our YouTube channel to uh, to watch these videos. And of course, these videos are available to uh, the general public. So feel free to, to watch it uh, on your own time and uh, also share it with your, uh, with, uh, your network. Uh, so we have uh, uh, the uh, chat box that you can use to... Uh, uh, to communicate with uh, with us, uh, it's enabled now. Uh, also, you can ask your questions uh, uh, in a question box. Uh, feel free to ask your questions there. Uh, um, uh, there, you can always communicate with each other in the in the chat room. But uh, uh, please ask your questions in the question box because that's how we can. Uh, basically we'll go on and look at the questions and then uh, we'll try to uh, to um, ask them from our uh, speaker uh, uh, another point that i wanted to uh, mention is uh let me share my screen again Uh, we also have a poll, uh, a survey that you can uh, uh, participate and then uh, uh, basically uh, provide us with your feedback about the quality of this uh, talk and then also this e-seminar series. Uh, uh, also, our next speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Shana Kelly from University of Toronto. Uh, she will be talking about uh, taking biomolecular sensors from the bench to the clinic. Uh, Dr. Sh Kelly is a serial uh, uh, entrepreneur and uh, she has uh, started a few companies from, from her lab. So um, I'm sure uh, uh, you will enjoy her talk. She will have a lot of experience to share with us. Uh, so don't forget to participate uh, in, the, in, in her talk next week. And... Uh, uh, make sure that you share uh, the information about uh, this e-seminar series with your uh, with your uh, network and uh, let them know uh, about uh, our next uh, upcoming speakers. Uh, also, uh, you can get uh, most up-to-date information about our e-seminar series uh, using our Twitter. Please follow our Twitter, TransBME. Uh, uh, you can always uh, email me. Uh, uh, and uh, Dr. Savaji Human, uh, if you have any questions, we are the co-organizers of this uh, this seminar series. You can also follow us on uh, Twitter. Uh, you can also ask um, uh, any questions if you have uh, from from our coordinator Vahid, uh, and you can also follow him on on, on the Twitter. Uh, uh, I would also uh, like to uh, uh, to thank our uh, speakers. Uh, uh, sorry, our our uh, uh, sponsors, uh, Transmed Tech uh, Institute. Uh, Transmed Tech is uh, uh, goal is to support the development of innovative medical technologies, train the next generation of professional, and make innovations in uh, life sciences and engineering. Uh, 
uh, Transmed Tech provides an integrated uh, environment that supports interdisciplinary uh, collaborative processes and co-creation of new medical technologies and intervention interventions to catalyze their development and adoption by users. Uh, we also would like to thank MedTech uh, Talent Accelerator, which is a training program uh, designed to launch the next generation of industry-ready talent uh, for the Canadian uh, medical uh, technology sector. Uh, this program is a collaboration between uh, Ryerson, uh, McGill, uh, 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 Ryerson University and McGill University and, uh, and MedTech Canada and also its uh, member companies. Um, so with that, uh, I would like to now uh, invite our speaker uh, to join the meeting. Uh, let me find uh, Dr. Paganelli. All right, so. Give me a second. Give me a second. Sorry for that. Should be Max. So let me just find Max. There you go. Hello, Mozen. Hello, man. Hello, hello. hello uh, sorry for uh, like a, a little bit of technical issues. Uh, so no the user here is like uh, just like some random numbers. So I couldn't find your actual name here. But it's it's again, it's a great pleasure to have uh, 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 Dr. Uh, uh, Paganelli uh, with us today. Uh, I'm honored to have him uh, here with us uh, as a speaker. Uh, Dr. Paganelli is an uh, assistant professor of uh, pediatrics at the University of Montreal. And uh, he is uh, the director of the liver tissue engineering and cell therapy lab. Uh, and uh, at the St. Johnston Research Center, he completed his medical studies and training in uh, pediatrics at the University of Rome, La Sapienza. I hope I uh, I pronounce it correctly. I, I, I love Rome and uh, I would love to go and then visit that beautiful city. Unfortunately, with this COVID situation that we have, it's not gonna be possible for us. But I mean, I watch the videos about Rome and then enjoy this uh, actually uh, the beautiful, and historic city of Rome. So you're so lucky to 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 to, uh, to live there. Uh, so after uh, uh, graduating from from University of Rome, uh, uh, he moved to Brussels and Belgium for two years uh, uh, for training in hepatology and liver transplantation at Clinique Saint Luc, and received a PhD in uh, cell therapy at the University. Uh, Catholic de Louvain. Uh, I hope I pronounced it correctly. My, my French is not very good. Uh, so uh, then uh, he uh, moved to Canada and brought his uh, experience in uh, stem cell research to University of Montreal. Uh, he has been very successful in obtaining uh, funding from, from major funding agencies in, in Canada. Uh, Canadian Institute for uh, Institutes for Health Research, CIHR, FRQS, and the Stem Cell Network, among many, many other uh, achievements and and uh, uh, fundings that he's and his team were able to uh, to obtain over the past few years. Uh, uh, so, uh, Dr. Paganelli authored uh, several papers and book chapters uh, in the area of uh, hepatology and liver uh, transplantation. He is uh, well known, he is a uh, world renowned researcher in, in this area. And then he has uh, three patent applications 
uh, that we recently licensed. So uh, he's quite familiar with the translational part of the research as well, which is which is amazing. Uh, and then he was the first non-American to be awarded the prestigious research scholar in uh, liver disease award from uh, Guilet Sciences. Dr. Paganelli uh, co-founded the regenerative uh, medicine uh, startup uh, called Morphocell Technologies Institute. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, he is now the CEO of the, uh, the company. Uh, and the goal of Morphocell uh, Technologies is to uh, transform the treatment of liver diseases using, using uh, stem cell based uh, therapies. Uh, Dr. Paganelli, it's a great pleasure to have you with us. Uh, I really appreciate that you accepted our invitation to give a talk at our e-seminar series. Uh, we are here to uh, listen to your talk and then learn from your experience. Thank you, Mozen. Thank you, man, for this kind of invitation, for the, the kind of introduction as well. So it's it's my pleasure, actually, to, to, to share with you some of the research we have done over, over the last few years and uh, talk about the, the hurdles and the, the, uh, the difficulties that there are always hidden, uh, not only in research, but in, in, in translation. So um, I can share my screen. You should be able to see it. Uh, yes, yes, great. Nice and clear. Okay, so this is my, my disclosure, as, as um, Monsen said, uh, with Morphosa Technologies. And uh, Monsen and Uman asked me to, to give you a little bit of uh, background of, on my, my work, uh, about how I, I finished doing what I do. And I'm basically a pediatrician. So my, my training is in, uh, as, as a medical doctor, and then I trained five years in pediatrics. Uh, this was in Rome. I'm, I, actually, I, I was born there, I lived there, for uh, for almost 30 years, so it's uh, uh, it's my home, and uh, and this obviously this condi this situation right now with the, the pandemics makes uh, communication and visiting family pretty pretty difficult. So and I'm sure many of you uh, share this uh, actually the the, the 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 difficulty of moving around during the pandemics uh, of studying abroad or working abroad. Uh, from from Rome, as Mosen said, I moved to Belgium. And the reason actually to go there was really to uh, improve my clinical skills. So never, never thought about doing any basic research. Uh, I was doing clinical research uh, on pediatric gastroenterology and hepatology. And I moved to Belgium to learn about liver transplantation and to uh, become a, a better uh, pediatric hepatologist. Uh, once I was there, I discovered uh, the, 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 the world of stem cells and how the potential of stem cells for treating uh, any disease and for treating liver disease in particular. So uh, when I was offered to, to do a PhD and stay there uh, against any, uh, any previous uh, program, actually, uh, I decided to, to stay. And, uh, and with my family, actually, we decided to stay in Belgium. We uh, went through, my, my wife and I, a PhD, and then, uh, and then my, actually, we brought together my, we brought, brought with us our, our daughter, and after four years in Belgium, uh, we received an offer to move uh, to Canada and to develop the, the cell therapy uh, for liver disease at, at St. Justine. So basically, as you can see, uh, my, my journey has been a journey from good weather to bad weather to worse weather, basically. So uh, uh, from the, the, the sunshine in Rome to the rain in Brussels to the snow in, in Montreal. Uh, but actually, I'm very happy about all this journey and the opportunity that I received uh, moving to Saint Justine, actually, with the what was really appealing uh, was the uh, freedom of uh, launching a, a research program that was pretty bold and pretty risky. Uh, something that's uh, usually hard to do in uh, in uh, countries uh, like, like in several European countries, I would say. So um, 
I was lucky with with funding. I was lucky that my uh, our preliminary results were actually good enough to uh, to encourage agencies to support the research, and uh, we actually based our entire research program in trying to meet the milestones. So we uh, always delivered what we promised all along our our research until now, and uh, and this has obviously helped with uh continuing being funded uh the the lab i opened at saint justine uh on uh, on uh, liver uh cell engineering and tissue engineering and cell therapy uh actually wouldn't and would have not been possible if it wasn't for uh actually my wife we opened the lab together so we've been working together uh since the beginning and this was actually my my secret about the uh, success of the lab. And obviously all the great students that uh, have been working with us and that have been taking the risk of jumping into a, uh, a, a young lab because the lab was started in 2015. Uh, then the, our research program actually went very pretty fast and then we developed a new treatment and we were in a position where we needed to translate this technology to make it available to the patients I was seeing every day in the clinic. And this is why we decided to uh, create Morphosal Technologies. It was an entire new adventure uh, with obviously uh, many hurdles and uh, in a very exciting uh, challenge. And, and the, the reason behind that is that you really need uh, to get to the, uh, the, the industry world if you want to bring cell therapies uh, to the people. So I see these babies with liver failure uh, in my clinical practice. And the only way to actually bring an alternative uh, to them uh, as quick as possible is actually to rely on the uh, the capitals that are available to the private market and that are not unfortunately are not available to the public uh, system. So as uh, we said, uh, my my entire research is based on liver tissue engineering. Uh, we are uh, actually we use our platform and our models for several projects. We obviously study liver development, uh, always using, uh, trying to remain in the human system. And, uh, and we actually are not a fundamental lab, but we need to do some basic research uh, to improve our, our results. So obviously uh, uh, diving into stem cell biology is something that we were obliged to do and we are enjoying more and more. Uh, we use our liver tissue uh, for disease modeling, both in two dimensions and in three dimensions. Uh, and uh, obviously this is a translational lab. So as a physician, as a practicing physician, I try always to stay uh, close to, the, uh, to the, the question asked by my patients, to the need they have. And uh, I think this is uh, what can make the difference uh, between a translational lab and a, and a fundamental and basic lab where we don't have the same knowledge, we don't have the same uh, expertise of many of the uh, competing labs, but the proximity with the clinic can give us a, uh, a different view of, of the problem that sometimes can be, can be helpful. Uh, and then obviously uh, the, the the therapy. So all everything we are doing uh, aims at developing new treatments. So which is regener regenerative medicine for liver disease. Several kinds of liver disease. We we'll discuss about some of them, and with two different approaches. So the the, the autologous approach for the very rare conditions, and the allogenic approach for the most severe and most frequent conditions. Uh, in, and we'll discuss about what are the advantages and disadvantages. Uh, we are uh, focusing with our liver tissue specifically on liver failure. And the reason why we are focusing on liver failure is because this is my not nightmare. So this is the call you receive in the middle of the night, the patient that is, is arriving and that is extremely sick. Uh, for when we talk about liver failure, we have three types. We have acute, acute on chronic and chronic liver failure. And the most severe is the acute form. Acute form is consists in a dramatic loss of liver functions. Uh, which is extremely abrupt and it happens in uh, children and adults who have no pre-existing liver disease so they encounter often is is a, is, is a drug is a toxin is a a, uh, a virus or some many very often actually we don't even know what what is the cause behind and uh, this cause destroys the liver and the patient uh, can go uh, from presentation to coma in less than two weeks so it's extremely severe um, it is progressive 
and it is actually uh, so fast that the liver is not capable of regenerating fast enough. The liver is very effective at regenerating itself, uh, but it doesn't happen fast enough. So you have a series of very severe complications from hepatic encephalopathy to gastrointestinal hemorrhage, ascites, and then you end up in multi-organ failure, coma, and death. So, and the death rate for these patients, uh, when you talk about infants and children, is more than 50%, so it's extremely severe. The only treatment available is liver transplantation, which is quite effective. Uh, the only problem is that we don't have enough organs for everyone. Uh, so finding a compatible organ is very hard, and it's very hard uh, in the short time we have to treat these patients, even harder for children and infants, because you also have to, ma to match the size, the body size. Uh, we still have a significant mortality and morbidity uh, on the short term, and then we have long-term complications, both on in the liver and actually uh, extrapatic complications. And even when things go well, these people have to live their entire life uh, under with, with, with an immunosuppression. So with all the complications that actually are uh, caused by this uh, drug regimen. Obviously, this is extremely frustrating when you talk about liver failure, because we know that up to 80% of the patient with acute liver failure could actually avoid liver transplantation if we were able to temporarily replace the liver functions, uh, just the time needed by the liver to regenerate uh, itself. So we are actually transplanting these people and exchanging one disease with another. So liver transplantation has pretty severe complications. Uh, and uh, it's a shame because if we were able to support liver functions, the liver would actually regenerate in most cases. Uh, so, obviously, for the last 20 years, people have been looking for alternatives and say, okay, what if we don't transplant the liver? What if we provide functioning liver cells? And uh, there have been several trials, several essays, uh, many case reports have been published over the years. This is an old review, but gives you an idea. Uh, I won't get into any details here, but uh, when you look at the data, uh, you realize that the results are extremely variable. So when you transplant hepatocytes to treat acute liver failure, you, the results are unpredictable. The, uh, the studies are impossible to compare. The doses are extremely variable, and there is a huge variability between the different donors. And the fact that after 20 years, uh, this practice is not widespread and it's only, only practiced in a very few specialized hospitals as a research program will tell you plenty about the effectiveness. Uh, the organ shortage is a major problem for liver cell therapy because you still need hepatocytes. So if we don't have organs for liver transplant, you won't have organs for, uh, to get hepatocytes. And we said that variability among donors is extremely important. So it's absolutely unpredictable. And then you have problem of engraftment. So these cells have to get into the liver and actually uh, find their niche into the liver. And so, and this phase is pretty long. So you have a bulk effect upon transplantation that actually will uh, dis disappear over a, over a few days. And then you have to wait several weeks before seeing an effect uh, once again, which is you don't have this kind of time in uh, acute liver failure. And then you have the problem of rejection. So these, are, these cells come from allogeneic donors. So you need immunosuppression and the immunosuppression has to be uh, even much uh, heavier than what you give for a liver transplant. And then the duration of the effect is very short. So as we said, it's really, really something that's very limited. So you, you need many donors, many injections over time, and the big problem is also logistics. So you, it's hard to have a donor ready when your patients arrive. So you use cryopreserved cells. But hepatocytes, they actually are very bad at withstanding cryopreservation. So the cryo damage is very important. There, there uh, been... Max, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, your slides are uh, frozen. So it's uh, we are still on the slide that you showed liver tissue engineering and oh, really? biology. Yes. Uh, so for some reason, I... A white, uh, I mean, maybe you can uh, re uh, unshare and then share your screen again. Uh, really that... sorry about that. No, that's okay. It's like the platform sometimes it has uh, lags and then, uh, uh, yeah, okay. okay. So we'll try from here. Yeah. You, you, you have seen this slide? No, no, the, we saw uh, the previous slide. You heard, you heard what I said. So this is basically text. So yeah. text. <laughs> and. and you now see this slide where I was talking about several, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. several process, treatments, 
and uh, this is where we were right now. So uh, you can see here in, uh, in, uh, in the bottom right uh, that this is a new approach where you encapsulate uh, hepatocytes and you transplant them into the peritoneal cavity. There is an effect that's uh, pretty interesting on the short term, but you can see that after a few days, this effect actually goes uh, down to almost zero. And this is the problem with uh, cell therapy at all for the liver because the hepatocytes are not happy when they are taken out of their environment. So uh, they tend to de-differentiate uh, quite quickly. Obviously, stem cells have been uh, have risen as an alternative, has risen as a, uh, a potential solution to produce liver cells in a more reproduct reprodu rep reproducible, reproducible manner so that you can actually produce uh, as many cells as you need, always the same quality, and to have them ready when the patients arrive. Please tell me if you, is the slide froze? So uh, here you should see a graph on the upper uh, left side. And we're talking about uh, several approaches. So when you transplant uh, hepatocytes that are derived from stem cells, uh, these actually hepatocytes uh, need to engraft and need to uh, actually mature within the liver. So their effect will grow over time. And if you look at this graph, you can see that uh, we're talking about hundreds of days from transplant to achieve a, uh, a good enough maturation. What this means is that uh, you have, um, this is actually a good approach or an approach that's actually um, reasonable when we talk about chronic liver failure. You can see in this other graph where the survival in mice with chronic liver failure it's better when you transplant these hepatocytes because they do have time to uh, acquire their mature functions. The problem is arrives when uh, we talk about acute liver failure because they, at that point, you don't have hundreds of days to wait. Uh, you have a very short therapeutic window, as we said. So your uh, hepatocytes derived from stem cells actually are not mature enough and they don't have time. So the survival is not different as compared to, to a sham group. And the reason for this is that uh, differentiating hepatocytes uh, from stem cells is very hard, and it's very hard to get them uh, mature enough. And uh, several studies have been done to show that actually what you obtain as hepatocytes is far, very far from the uh, hepatocytes into the liver. So what we've been doing uh, since the, the beginning actually is working, first of all, on improving the, uh, the, 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 our differentiation protocol. So start with, you, we use pluripotent stem cells and induce pluripotent stem, cell, stem cells mostly. And we try to really work on everything that's known for human liver development and try to uh, leverage all the uh, signals and connections and interaction between the different cell types to actually uh, improve the maturation of our cells. And you can see here that for the liver, you start from the, uh, actually the primitive streak, and then you have the definite endoderm, and then you go up with the liver bud, the liver bud will actually expand, and then you will get to the hepatocytes. This is a very simplified explanation, obviously, but there are so many signals that are uh, involved and that actually it's pretty hard to obtain the right, uh, the right protocol. We try to do our best, and we think that we achieved something that uh, can change the way we produce the cells. Uh, I hope you see my slide here. About please, please, uh, Monsen, just just cut me out if you see that slides are not uh, following my my speech. Sure, sure. And, so uh, we, what you should see here uh, the uh, some results about our new protocol, which is under review right yes. now. Yeah, uh, you can. With this protocol, we're now able to produce uh, hepatocyte-like cells that are comparable to primary hepatocytes for many of the uh, liver-specific markers. And, uh, and the, what you obtain is a very homogeneous population. Uh, for obviously some of the markers like alpha fetoprotein, we are still pretty different because they are not uh, as mature as the adult hepatocytes. But you still reach a pretty advanced uh, maturation, which is reflected in the uh, activity of these cells, because in terms of albumin secretion or, or urea production, or even cytochrome P450 activity, we are now in uh, uh, very similar to uh, our primary human hepatocytes, which is actually important if we want to use these cells for any uh, good modeling and therapy. Uh, we 
actually compare this protocol with previously uh, described protocols acting on different pathways. And we saw a, a pretty interesting difference in terms of the maturation we achieved. And as you can see, finally, these cells uh, cluster with primary human hepatocytes. But you can also notice here that they are still pretty far from uh, the, uh, the primary hepatocytes for most of the uh, liver specific markers. Uh, what's interesting as well is that we try to uh, tailor this protocol in a way that we can finally produce a lot of cells. So we can finally uh, have a quantity of cells at the end of the differentiation that uh, actually allows uh, to move on with potentially a, a therapeutic approach or a, a better modeling approach. This is just an example on what we have been working on. Obviously, we are in, in Quebec, so we we need we are funded by by the, the Quebec government, the Canadian government. So we try to uh, to work on specific diseases that are affecting our children and are pretty rare. This is tyrosinemia type one, a very severe disease that actually uh, results in more than eighty percent mortality if the children are not treated. We have an effective treat treatment, which is a former actually it's an herbicide. And this herbicide has been repurposed for this disease. So the exact dose we have to give and the exact uh, the, the, the long-term side effects are not well known for this specific treatment. So we've been working on a model, uh, obviously using CRISPR-Cas9 to uh, try to have uh, isogenic controls. And we started with patients' iPSCs, and then we created a control uh, that has the corrected uh, mutation. And then we generated mutated uh, lines from uh, healthy controls. And with that, we actually created a model that is finally representative of the disease. So we have in vitro something that can recreate what we see in the liver of the patients. And thanks to that, uh, we have been testing the, 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 the treatment, the nitisinum, the treatment that's available. Uh, and we managed to determine the dose that's actually the minimal dose that needs to be uh, available and provided uh, in the blood, so to avoid toxicity uh, in the uh, hepatocytes. This is just an example of what you can do with these kind of models when they become uh, mature enough to be uh, representative. Uh, obviously, we think about therapy and we think about the fact that uh, uh, we using patients' iPSCs and correcting the cells, the, this, the mutation uh, with um, CRISPR-Cas9 or any other genome editing technology, we could have enough cells to actually treat their disease. Uh, so uh, developing what's uh, called in our autologous uh, cell therapy for liver disease. The problem is that there are many unsolved problems for this approach. So the first of all, first of all is maturation. So I showed you it is better than previously described, but still far from the, the hepatocytes. So we are not there yet in terms of maturation. Then you have the problem of engraftment that we discussed. And then you have the problem of giving yourselves an advantage on the cells of the patient. Because if we are talking about chronic diseases or metabolic diseases, uh, these livers are just missing one enzyme. So they are not very sick. So there is no advantage for your cells uh, compared to the patient cells. And, uh, and that's safety. So uh, you know the concerns uh, of regulators about iPS-derived treatments. Uh, there will be, uh, will there be any teratomas, any tumors, any uh, problems with the uh, thrombosis when you inject them, for example? So all this is still to be sorted out. And uh, when you talk about autologous and translation, you talk about feasibility. So feasibility is a big problem. We're talking about billion cells that need to be produced for these patients. And if you have to go from the patient cells this is a, a very and a huge um, challenge, obviously, in terms of feasibility, in terms of cost, and in terms of uh, actually having, uh, getting to the development of the therapy. So we are not obviously forgetting this, but we we know that there are a lot of hurdles to overcome. Uh, the problem with maturation comes from the fact that the liver is not a two-dimensional organ. So in the liver, there are several cell types that actually interact. So uh, it, it is, uh, I don't know if you see my cartoon here, but basically it is uh, something that uh, need to, uh, to take advantage of the interaction with the other cells, the cell-to-cell -cell contacts, the paracrite signals that are actually uh, important to be, uh, the, the, the gradient of these signals is very important. All that, you don't have it in two dimensions. So you need to go in three dimensions. 
you need to, to go into organoids to try to improve the maturity. And this is what we have been doing. You should be able to see a kind of a liver tree here. And uh, uh, so we started as other groups uh, around the world to work on uh, organoids and on growing uh, organs, basically liver organs. And what we've been doing is uh, using um, iPS cells, as we discussed, and differentiating them into three cell types. So we wanted uh, a model organoids that were all derived from the, single, the same uh, specific uh, iPS line. So we have our hepatoblasts, we have endothelial progenitor cells, and mesenchymal progenitor cells. We put them together and we create uh, mini organs that are uh, actually self-aggregate to, uh, to actually allow the three cell types to interact and to perform actually a certain, uh, to recreate the liver niche, the liver microenvironment. And when you look at, obviously the, no, no details here, but you, you need to find good protocols to obtain uh, mesenchymal progenitor cells and endothelial progenitor cells that are of the uh, actually um, uh, that have the, the correct phenotype uh, actually to uh, allow the recreation of the liver niche. Uh, I, I want to share with you the the the, uh, the different um, models we are working in because uh, some of them are under review, some of them I cannot share them yet. Uh, but uh, we what we obtain are tiny. Uh, organs, tiny livers, I would say, that can recreate some aspects of the liver uh, pathophysiology. Not every aspect, obviously. They are, there are, as you see, they are very similar to a liver biopsy on the upper left uh, when you look at them. But uh, there is a lot of um, extracellular matrix forming, so they are obviously good for some application and not for others. What's interesting is that in these uh, organoids, you have the recreation, the formation of uh, bile ducts that are uh, from, they actually can uh, go from any level of maturation. So we are really able to reproduce the, uh, morph the, mor the morphogenesis of bile ducts. And we're able to uh, model what's called the ductoplate, which is a very important development step uh, in the liver and which is actually at the center of several liver diseases. So as you can see here, you have the, the on, on the right, you have the uh, ductoplate at CK18 positive, CK, uh, sorry, CK18 positive, and then you see that uh, the, the ductoplate will uh, actually form bile ducts here that will form and then will actually branch inside the organoid. We're using this obviously to study both liver development and to model these specific uh, diseases like allergic syndrome or uh, biliary dysplasias. Uh, the, in terms of therapy, these organoids have been developed uh, before every, anyone else by the group of uh, Takaori Takebe, who did an amazing work uh, showing that they can engraft in the mouse and then they can, they can recreate actually they can they can be vascularized by the uh, mouse uh, vessels and this is a very actually very elegant and uh, a fantastic work that shows that these organoids can actually engraft within the, uh, the the recipient's body the problem is that they are not mature so they are more mature than the cells we put in but they are still far from being mature as the human liver so when you use them for therapy uh, this is still from, from Takebe, you can see that uh, the, the function is very limited. This is a subacute liver module, li liver failure model. So you transplant the organoids and then you induce the liver failure. And as you can see, to have a significant difference compared to the sham group, uh, the end uh, had to be increased to 114. So uh, the difference is very limited uh, because these organoids really need to, uh, to mature within the body. So uh, actually, obviously this is, wasn't good enough for us in terms of uh, treating uh, liver disease and in terms of our original um, aim to treat acute liver failure. So uh, we, uh, we, tried, we started to focus on what are the main hurdles, the main problems of developing a cell therapy for acute liver failure. And as we said, the most important one is uh, mature liver functions. 
so you need to have something that's mature from day one. So you, your patient is very sick. You need to stay within the therapeutic window. So you need to uh, have something that's fully functional and fully mature and that can mature entirely in your lab, doesn't need any in vivo maturation. I hope you see you see this slide. And then uh, once again, please stop me if, if you don't. Uh, then mm -hmm. you need something to be safe. So you need, you need something to be uh, safe. So you need uh, to be aware of the concerns of teratomas, of tumor formation, of rejection of uh, foreign body reaction, all of that needs to be taken into account. Uh, ideally, uh, obviously you, you want a protocol that's uh, scalable and reproducible. So you want something that will allow you to produce enough uh, treatments for all the, uh, the patients that are out there. We're talking about uh, the acute liver failure is a rare disease, but when you go for, when you consider acute on chronic liver failure, you're talking about uh, actually hundreds of thousands of people worldwide. So you need something that's, uh, that will allow uh, a, a, a proper translation. Uh, to do that, you ideally need an allogenic approach. So an autologous approach would be very difficult to, uh, to commercialize and to bring into the clinic. You need to solve the problem of cryopreservation of the cells, so, uh, which is a major problem for, for, for liver cells, as we discussed. And uh, at the end of the day, you also need to consider implementability, uh, which means that as, as clinicians, we are uh, very, we it's very hard to change our mind. So we treat patients with the treatments that we are used to, 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 uh, used to every day, and it's hard to change a physician's uh, practice. So you need something that will not change the way surgeons uh, and, and hepatologists actually treat these patients uh, in the several uh, centers around the world. So you don't want something that will oblige the center to have any uh, cell culture uh, knowledge or expertise or any stem cell expertise. You want something that will not change the practice too much. So this is what we developed and what we call the encapsulated liver tissue. Uh, as we discussed before, as for the big organoids, we uh, start from APSLs, we differentiate into three cell types. And in this case, in, in this, for this actually use, we keep the size very small. So we have a controlled size organoids. We keep the size small so that everything is equally uh, nourished and, and perfused within the organoid. And then we uh, encapsulate these organoids as a tissue all together. So we have thousands of organoids that are encapsulated together within a polyethylene glycol based biomaterial, uh, which is then photopolymerized uh, and it becomes uh, solid, solid enough that we can manipulate it with surgical tools. Uh, what's important here is that this biomaterial is non-degradable. So we have been uh, using something that's really, uh, we really wanted something that could not be attacked by the uh, enzymes in the body. And I will show you why uh, in, in just in a while. And we also tuned the biomaterial to reproduce the physical properties of the liver so that it could recreate the environment, the microenvironment, and uh, help the maturation of the organoid. What we do with this is that we implant it into the peritoneal cavity of, in the future of the patients right now, of mice, and uh, we don't actually create any anastomosis. So we don't want any vascularization. We don't want it to be on the liver. It, it just ex exchanges with the peritoneal fluid, which as you know, is in total balance with the blood. Uh, you are probably familiar with the concept of peritoneal dialysis for kidney failure. It's basically the same principle. So the peritoneal fluid uh, perfuses the, the, uh, the ELT and will provide uh, actually nutrients to the organoids, uh, oxygenation to the organoids, and will actually allow the organoids to metabolize everything toxin that is not metabolized by the failing liver. Uh, as, as we said, we can manipulate that with surgical tools. We can actually produce that in a 96 plate format if we want to, to use it for drug screening, for, for uh, drug testing and drug development. This is how you, uh, you, the, the organoids are within the material, so you see these little spheres, and they stay. Uh, the image is very doesn't doesn't look very nice here, but anyway, it's uh, they are oh, they are stay alive uh, for a very long time. We know that we we actually arrived to more than 15 weeks. So these organoids within the biomaterial in vitro in the lab, they stay alive for more than 15 weeks. But what's more important is that they continue their maturation. So we achieve full maturation in vitro in the lab. The biomaterial has been tailored in a way that uh, the porosity, obviously, and the mesh size, in a way that we 
what gets in and what gets out and what, what, what actually can uh, escape from the, the biomaterial. And we kept it pretty tight so that uh, the cells cannot escape, the immune cells cannot enter. And uh, also, this, actually, we try to um, keep out the larger, larger proteins as well so that uh, you can see here, for example, how albumin can get through, whereas IgGs are, are blocked. Uh, in terms of function, I told you about maturation, and the maturation is uh, very interesting because uh, when not only we reach the same levels of, of the uh, primary hepatocytes for most of the CYP450 uh, CYP functions, but when you look at induction and inhibition, you can see that they are at least as good as primary hepatocytes, if not better for some of the cytochromes. So, uh, and these are all metabolically certified primary human hepatocytes. Uh, in, in actually in a um, cultivated in a micro pattern function. So this is the, our best gold standard control for primary human hepatocytes. Uh, they are capable of metabolizing uh, liver specific drugs like tacrolimus, and they also produce metabolites that we only see in the patient's blood that we cannot see in uh, hepatocytes in culture. If you look at uh, liver specific proteins, for example, albumin secretion is very effective, as you see, we need a few weeks uh, for the uh, ELT to become mature, so to, for the organoids to mature within the biomaterial. And once they do, they actually uh, go well above primary human hepatocytes and well above the uh, IPS-derived hepatocytes, that's the HLC here. And, uh, and you can see that they actually uh, are even 10 times more uh, effective in producing albumin than primary human hepatocytes. And whereas hepatocytes in culture tend to de-differentiate over a few days and weeks, uh, the ELT is above, actually within clinically relevant levels for at least 90 days. What's also interesting is alpha fetoprotein. I, I mentioned before that alpha fetoprotein is a fetal protein, was still high in our uh, IPS-derived hepatocytes. Uh, the ELT is the first uh, stem cell-derived product to show a decrease of alpha fetoprotein, protein, which is what happens in the human liver a, actually a few months after birth. So they acquire a fully adult phenotype. Same thing for most of the uh, liver functions. Uh, one of the most deadly uh, complications of acute uh, liver failure is hepatic encephalopathy, which is based on ammonia uh, metabolism. The, the, actually the, uh, uh, the, the impossibility of the failing liver to metabolize ammonia and other toxin. And the ELT is very effective in metabolizing ammonia into urea uh, and when we actually extrapolate this data, we realize that it is uh, a, a small ELT with not so many cells is capable of uh, uh, actually achieving more than 20% of the the maximum theoretical uh, liver um, uh, ammonia metabolism capacity, which is uh, actually by several orders of magnitude more than what has been described with other stem cell derived uh, models before. Uh, not actually not so uh, secondary as we said, not so uh, less less um, uh, amazing, but as equally important is the fact that the ELT uh, can withstand cryopreservation. preservation. So we can cryopreserve preserve it, and after thawing, it goes back to the pre-thawing, pre-freezing, uh, sorry, pre-freezing uh, functions, which is very important, obviously, for this kind of of treatments, as we discussed. We're working now on the time needed uh, after thawing to uh, regain full uh, functionality, but uh, actually it's uh, extremely effective in uh, going back to the pre-freezing conditions. Uh, then obviously we are developing this as a therapy. So we looked whether it is biocompatible and uh, we realized that um, when we put the human ELT into immunocompetent mice, uh, and we leave it there for 30 days without any immunosuppression. We then explant it. Uh, there, are, there is no inflammation. There, is, there are no adhesions. It can be explanted very easily. We measured the peritoneal macrophages over one week, and we saw no inflammation uh, because the biomaterial is obviously uh, biocompatible. Uh, we also looked at the human organoids within the explanted uh, ELT, and they are still well alive after four weeks uh, into an immunocompetent uh, mouse always without immunosuppression. Uh, when we look at the biomaterial here is after, after two months, you can see that there is a very thin capsule, uh, fibrotic capsule forming on the ELT, 
uh, which is very thin, but it is there. So we really try to minimize free body reaction, but still you have some. But after 30 days, when we measure liver functions in the explanted uh, ELT from the mice I told you before, uh, the liver functions are, are still there and are still well comparable to uh, primary human hepatocytes, which means that the, thine, the, the tiny uh, fibrotic capsule forming doesn't uh, prevent the exchanges and the function of the uh, ELT. And this is uh, as a control what happens with the organoids when they are not encapsulated in these mice, as expected, obviously. Uh, the, we said that we control the porosity of the biomaterial. So the biomaterial actually prevents any contact between the uh, embedded organoids and the uh, recipient's uh, immune system. So it is basically the organoids are invisible to the immune system. We did, for example, this is an in vitro test where uh, called the mixed lymphocyte reaction test, so MLR. Uh, you put uh, uh, allogenic T cells in contact with several uh, uh, cells that actually can uh, generate a reaction in terms of replication, in terms of activation of T cells. And you can see that uh, even the non-encapsulated organoids, so the blue, uh, do not elicit a strong response uh, because the liver is not a very monogenic organ. Whereas the dendritic cells, they do elicit a strong T cell response. Uh, what happens is, is that when we do encapsulate the dendritic cells, so it's the elicit any response as expected. Uh, same thing for the for the telephone gamma, and obviously uh, the cells are destroyed where they are non encapsulated. We're talking about the dendritic cells here, uh, whereas they are well alive. Uh, after after the, the test when they are encapsulated. Uh, in vivo, uh, we use into immunocomponent mice one Max. We lost your, yeah. Well, we have some uh, technical issues. Uh, it's always, uh, I mean, it's normal to see uh, disconnections. Uh, uh, usually when the internet is uh, uh, is uh, basically slow and uh, and sometimes there are, let me just invite Max again. I apologize for technical issue. I see these connections when I'm teaching courses online. Uh, in the summer, I had these issues. Uh, and, uh, Hi, Hi, Max. Hi. Sorry, I mean, I there was a, like, uh, yeah, it was a disconnection. But uh, let's let's go back to your to uh, to your slides. Yeah, I promise it's almost over. I will. <laughs> no, I'm enjoying it. It's a great uh, work uh, you folks are doing, and uh, I see many many questions. Uh, be happy uh, to answer. I will be finished in, in a few slides. So sure, it's, uh, sure. Over. But if you want, we can stop here. No, no, no. I would love to see what your you 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 folks are doing. So uh, basically, continue, no, no rejection, as we were saying, okay. and uh, you should see my uh, tumorigenicity slide here. Uh, nothing gets into the organoid, uh, not into the ELT, and nothing gets out from the ELT. So we have no tumors when we uh, transplant this human ELT into immunodeficient uh, mice. And uh, when we, we also address uh, regulators' concerns about using about teratomas, so we took undifferentiated iPS cells that generate big teratomas in these mice, and we encapsulate them. And as you can see, Uh, I apologize again. Uh, so let me uh, connect. Uh, 
Linux again. Or Let's see if this technical issue is being resolved. Uh, I'm back. I don't know what happened. <laughs> yeah, that's it's normal. I mean, uh, I was telling uh, the, uh, the the participants that uh, this is normal, and then I usually see these connections uh, when I'm teaching courses. So. Please go ahead. So sh you should be able to see my my slide here. Yeah. Great. So I was saying these are immunocompetent mice, a deadly dose of CCL4. This is a very severe acute liver failure model. The CCL4 destroys the liver and the mice actually start dying after one day. Uh, what we did is differently from it. Any, any, anyone else before is that we wait for the mice to be very sick. So we wait, uh, we want a clinically run model. So once they are very sick at day zero, we treat them with the human ELT and we give them no immunosuppression. Obviously the control group uh, receives just the empty by material. And the two groups were obviously uh, equal in terms of severity of the disease. And you can see the difference here. We have, uh, after 35 days, 68% of the mice receiving the ELT that actually survived compared to 29% of controls, uh, which was obviously significant. And we just an end of 25. Uh, at day 35, what we did is that we sacri sacrificed the controls and we explanted the ELT from the surviving mice. And we let we leave them uh, actually survive, leave for another two months without anything in their body and just showing that they are completely regenerated and they are uh, actually cured. Uh, this works on hepatic encephalopathy. I would actually not, not go into the details because it's taking a little bit too long for you, but uh, basically this treatment, there is a, a significant difference between treated mice and controls in terms of uh, neurological uh, signs and hepatic encephalopathy. Uh, we also see that uh, of those that are very sick, so the most severe ones, uh, that are almost dying at the moment of the treatment because, they, as I told you, the, the disease is the, the model is very severe. Uh, we have 27 percent of the mice in the ELT group that actually recover despite the severity uh, of the encephalopathy versus the six percent in the control group. And the ELT also accelerated uh, the regeneration of the recipient's liver. This was a surprise at the beginning because we didn't expect that. When we look at the, at the livers of the surviving animals, we realize that the mice receiving the ELT are uh, actually the, the livers of the mice receiving the ELT were uh, practically normal already at 24 days, whereas the controls were still a, lot, a work in progress. They were recovering. The, the liver enzymes were almost normal, but they actually uh, needed, were still a work in progress. So there was an accelerated regeneration in the mice receiving the ELT. So in summary, finally for you, it's, uh, we are really trying to, to work on stem cells because we believe that stem cell can change the way we treat liver disease. So we go from a treatment to a cure, especially for liver failure. And uh, the ELT as in vitro functions are comparable, at least comparable to primary human hepatocytes. But we have advantages uh, in terms of unlimited supply, uh, consistent and long lasting efficacy, and also capacity to withstand crab preservation. Uh, we, the encapsulation provides immune isolation and it eliminates the risk of rejection and the need of immunosuppression and also provides a protection against tumor formation. And, uh, and then uh, last but not least, the ELT allows replacing liver functions uh, in immunocompetent mice with liver failure without the need of immunosuppression, which uh, actually uh, it's uh, promising uh, to make this into an allogenic uh, treatment. Obviously, we need clinical trial, and this is my last slide, uh, and this is why we uh, actually uh, created Morphocell and we transferred the technology to Morphocell, is because uh, this is just the beginning. So these data are just the beginning of a long journey that will lead So being able to produce enough cells of always the same good quality uh, in order to actually generate uh, the clinical batches. And this is a huge work and maybe the biggest hurdle for any cell therapy. 
Uh, then once we are at clinical scale, uh, we are ready to pull the trigger on the uh, large animals. So we'll do pigs to prove the uh, efficacy in another uh, species as required by regulators. And then we will go through the pivotal safety studies that are needed uh, to get an approval for a uh, clinical trial application or an IND. Uh, in the meanwhile, there is all the uh, GMP implementation. I have all the protocols that you saw uh, are, have been designed with the GMP translation. We lost Max and we invite him again. Uh, it seems that we lost Max. Uh, he's trying to connect, but apparently uh, the internet connection is not uh, very good. So it's a pretty interesting work and then shows the importance of uh, and challenges of uh, of uh, cell uh, therapy and cell delivery. Uh, Max, welcome back again. Yeah, that's I, I, I think I, I will stop with the slides. That was the last one. So it's uh, the, the, the most important one is the, just the one about the uh, people working on the project, collaborators and financing. So I will show you that, but I, I promise it's the last one because sure, sure. Uh, I, I should have done this from from home, I think, because the Sanderson connection doesn't seem to be. Yeah, we can see. Uh... We can see your slide, uh, but it seems that uh, it's frozen. But as you can see, I mean, this uh, highly interdisciplinary research could not be done without the support of funding agencies, many, many funding agencies and different groups working together. Uh, and. Uh, uh, and uh, working together to develop such uh, an interesting technology uh, that has great potential in uh, treatment of patients with uh, with uh, liver failure and liver diseases. Uh, let me just invite Max again. I have a, a personal uh, uh, story about uh, uh, liver diseases. And uh, I lost a friend uh, when I was doing a postdoc. I lost a friend uh, to acute liver disease. Uh, she was an amazing researcher, uh, uh, Masume Kaderi, and then uh, uh, and then she uh, her liver failed in uh, in uh, in just a few days, and then uh, she was hospitalized for only. Uh, two weeks and then we lost her after two weeks and uh, oh hi hello Max again uh, so uh, welcome back uh, so Max uh, I was telling uh, the most new one I can I can see you now so I don't can know you? if you're connected I see you are connected but I can't see you and I can't hear you can't you hear me hello we can hear you well Max? 
we lost Max again. Uh, so he's he's reconnecting. But uh, as I was saying, uh, uh, I lost a friend uh, to uh, to liver failure. We didn't know what why this happened. Uh, it was uh, it was very uh, traumatic. Uh, and uh, uh, and then back then we were thinking about uh, ways uh, to uh, you know that uh, ways that could be developed and could be uh, technologies that could be developed to to save uh, to save her. Uh, Max, can you hear me? Yeah, sure. I can hear you. Okay. Great, yeah. great. So I was telling the participants about the significance of your work, uh, and I can, I was telling everyone that I I, I, I relate to your research. Uh, I lost a friend. She was very young, less than forty years old. Uh, she was diagnosed with uh, with uh, acute liver failure, and then we just lost her in in just two weeks. It's uh, it was very. Uh, I mean, it, we were very uh, affected by her loss, and then, uh, and it was, uh, uh, and we appreciate the research that is uh, uh, that is being conducted for um, on, on uh, uh, these kinds of uh, diseases. Uh, so I, I, heard, I heard I heard everything. Okay, um, great. So, so, yeah, Fantastic. Let let's you... go to to Q and A. Uh, so we have many many questions uh, from you. Uh, the first question is uh, about uh, uh, the durability of the so uh, Spiro or Spiro. Uh, uh, he uh, or she has asked a few questions. Uh, so the first question is about the. Uh, durability of the cell therapy. So the question is, how durable does a cell therapy need to be? Uh, last how long for ALF to provide enough time for patients' liver to regenerate or bridge to transplant? So that's yeah, the, yeah, this is a very good question, actually. For, for ALF or for ACLF, uh, you have meaningful regeneration uh, within two weeks. Then this is not the entire regeneration. So having a uh, restitution ad integrum, so having the liver go back to the original, actually, uh, structure, or original norm normal structure, uh, takes several weeks and may, may take months as well. But you need to support the actually the two, three weeks that are needed to go back to have uh, enough uh, liver function to support life. And this is actually what we are trying to do. So we, in the clinical trial, we plan to, to leave this in for three weeks. And then after that, obviously, we will try to establish uh, specific points. And OK, unfortunately, we lost Max again. Uh, so let me see if I can uh, re-invite him. Again, I apologize for the technical issue, but this is something that uh, that is uh, out of control. And sometimes this happens. Uh, so let me see if I... Uh, Right, Max again. Mosen, uh, everything is fine on my side. So I don't know if is there is there a way I can call and I can call in. I don't know if it's the, the, the problem. They, they, the connection seems fine here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there is a way to call in. Well, this app does this platform does not have a, a phone call like Zoom and others okay. uh, feature. So what we are going to, what we can do is that we can continue with this, uh, with this uh, basically talk, and then with the Q and A, and then see how it goes. So one thing I can do is I can stop my, uh, uh, yeah, the web. So I can stop my uh, video uh, to uh, change to like you know uh, reduce the 
uh, uh, like the bandwidth. Uh, so the next question. Uh, so uh, so uh, so let's go back to the first question about the durability of cell therapy that needs to be done for ALF. Uh, and yeah, I, I was I was saying about about the uh, two two three weeks is the time we are aiming for. Uh, to have actually to uh, overcome and uh, to restore enough liver function to sustain uh, actually vital functions. And, uh, and then late, later on in following clinical trial, we will establish thresholds to, to exactly decide when to explant it. Okay. So it's perhaps two or three weeks. Yes, yes, yeah. in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the chat file. Uh, so another question is from NO High C. Uh, excellent talk and very creative work. And the question is, uh, uh, what the role? Uh, what is the role of in vivo imaging in uh, assessing the quality of the organelles? Yeah, I, ju I just share my my sure. Twitter handle. So if if people want to ask questions, please please sure. feel free, uh, send send an email or uh, Twitter or whatever, and I'll be happy to. Discuss. Sure, and then also uh, also we will share your email address uh, with with the with the audience as yes. well. Yes. Uh, so if they have questions, but the next question is uh, about uh, the role of in vivo imaging in assessing the quality of the organites. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, well, I mean, the the the, uh, uh, the participant asks uh, about your thoughts on on the role of in vivo imaging. Uh, yeah, when... in vivo imaging, I see it useful for to monitor, for example, uh, the, the tumor formation or things like that and spreading of the cells. Uh, not sure about the structure because here the organs we are developing are not that don't don't aim at reproducing the liver in terms of structure. So not sure that uh, it's useful. It can be very spectacular, very nice to do. Not sure it will add anything on the therapeutic side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Uh, the other question is, which is very relevant, and then I think you touched on uh, a little bit, uh, was if billions of cells are required for a cell therapy in liver failure, how scalable uh, is an organoid-based approach? But we are working on that. Obviously, it is it is feasible, and it is something that we are we are working. We are now capable of generating uh, liver cells and organoids in suspension, which is the first phase of the scale up. So this is the hardest, hard, the, the biggest hurdle is to produce these cells in suspension, and uh, now we we can do that. So now it's a matter of scale. So getting up to the uh, liters of uh, bioreactors that actually you need. And this is something that it seems trivial once you are in suspension. You, as you probably know, it is not. So every step mm -hmm. requires a significant process engineering, mm -hmm. which is what we are doing right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there are effects of shear stresses and everything when you have exactly. Yeah. But your encapsulation strategy actually uh, 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 overcomes this issue as well, uh, which is. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, but actually the, the, the encapsulation comes after. So yeah. the, once you have the organoids ready, then okay. you encapsulate them. And encapsulation, scaling up the encapsulation is something we have already sorted out. So that's not mm -hmm. a problem. Uh, the problem is actually having enough organoids and which means having enough liver cells uh, mm -hmm. to, and the other cell types to use the organoids. Once well, you get it, that, the encapsulation is not a problem. So is it possible to form organoids encapsulated in... in, in uh, in your beads, so let's say you make beads, uh, hollow beads, uh, core shell beads, and then you form these little, uh, little uh, cells. You just put all of them in these hollow beads, and then let them self-assemble and then form the organic. Is that something that yeah, is this possible? Is, yes, it is a possibility, and uh, these are there are several approaches we are exploring, obviously. And uh, the uh, the the advantage of this system is that this. Uh, we sort we actually developed uh, we are developing a way of having the organoid self-assemble uh, yeah. in suspension and without any uh, biomaterial involved, 
which mm-hmm. makes things easier later mm-hmm. on also for uh, regulatory discussions later on. Okay, okay. all right. Uh, so the other question is from uh, Dr. Oatley from, uh, from McGill. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, it would probably be desirable to remove the microbeads after their action is complete. Any plans to design a retrievable system? Uh, this is what we do. Our mm-hmm. system is entirely explantable. So these are not microbeads. This is a, a, a big product. So it's something that's easily manipulated by a surgeon, is fixed with four stitches to the abdominal uh, actually wall. And mm-hmm. then it's retrieved with a laparoscopic access. So mm-hmm. this is explantable and is exactly uh, what we have developed. Okay, that's great. That's great. Fantastic. So I have uh, one question myself uh, about the challenges uh, of obtaining regulatory approvals for cell-based therapies. I know that it's it's a it's pretty highly it's highly regulated and it's considered as. Uh, 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 basically, uh, you need to do a very rigorous safety analysis. So, what what are your thoughts on the process uh, uh, of of, uh, of obtaining regulatory approval approvals, and what are the challenges that you uh, you have faced so far? Yeah, the the first challenge that you have to keep in mind is the dif- are, are the difference between uh, jurisdictions. So, mm. if you develop if you develop a global therapy, which is the case, uh, you need to to have in mind the differences between several jurisdictions from, from Japan to Europe to FDA mm-hmm. to have Canada. So uh, we are trying to cover everything in mm-hmm. the, the experiments we are doing. Uh, we already met regulators for the first, uh, actually the you know preliminary uh, meetings and the feedback was extremely encouraging. So there is really a will of regulators to bring this therapy to the patients. Mm-hmm. So they are extremely helpful and we found it much, uh, much less uh actually hard than what we thought in terms of requirements uh mm-hmm. we i have to say that we we have designed all the experiments with the safety in mind so uh the safety for we spent much more energy on the safety since the, the efficacy wasn't the problem we really focused on safety mm-hmm. and we still have things to do obviously but yes it is highly regulated and you really need to to show com- a very good comparability you really need to have uh everything sorted out Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, try. I think it's important to try to be uh, as wide as possible because mm-hmm. the the huge cost of developing this kind of treatment mm-hmm. uh, becomes justified for investors uh, mm-hmm. from the investors' point of view mm-hmm. only if you are global in your in your uh, outreach. I see. Oh, great, great. Uh, uh, so another question is. Uh, 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 about the clinically relevant biomarkers uh, for uh, so, so the question is what are the clinically relevant biomarkers for what is produced by IPSC drive hepatocytes to work for ALF is it albumin what levels other biomarkers this is a very good a very good question and then uh, obviously we have two engineers that are actually helping to sort these questions out so we have our ideas we have our um, release criteria, internal release criteria that we are developing. We don't have yet the release criteria, the final release criteria. Uh, this, the problem with all these kind of uh, therapies and having a non-degradable by bi- material make make it even harder is the fact that you cannot characterize your product by composition, but you need to. Okay, uh, so it seems that this uh, technical issue persists. Uh, so uh, uh, let's uh, let me just connect uh, Dr. Paganelli again, and then uh, thank him for uh, his time and patience with the. Uh, with us, uh, for some reason, the system is not uh, working properly today. Uh, so, uh, as uh, as expect as. Uh, suggested by uh, Dr. Uh, Paganelli. Uh, you can ask uh, 
questions uh, on Twitter, and then also you can uh, email him. I'll share his email address with you. Uh, feel free to contact him and then ask him the questions. Uh, again, I apologize uh, for uh, this technical issue. Uh, we'll try to fix this issue for the next uh, uh, talks. Uh, Human, we cannot hear you. Uh, so with that, uh, I would like to thank everyone for participating in this talk. Uh, I'll try to uh, reconnect with, uh, with Max again, but it seems that uh, Dr. Paganelli is... not available. Uh, Again, these technical issues are normal, uh, happens uh, once in a while, uh, especially with us trying to, to connect. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to, uh, to end this session uh, today and then I'll uh, invite you to uh, to join the meeting next week uh, for uh, Dr. Kelly's talk. Uh, 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 I also would like to uh, thank again our uh, sponsors for this event. Uh, uh, so uh, we have uh, Transmed Tech uh, who supports us. Uh, 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 Transmed Tech is uh, aims to support the development of innovative medical technologies, train next, the next generation of professionals, and make innovation in life sciences and engineering. Uh, uh, the MedTech Talent Accelerator is also supporting this uh, this work, uh, this uh, this e seminars, these talks. Uh, so the MedTech Talent Accelerator is a training program designed to launch the next generation of industry ready talent for the Canadian medical technology sector. Uh, 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 and uh, last but not least, I would like to thank again our speaker, uh, Max, uh, Dr. Paganelli. Uh, it was an amazing talk. Uh, again, as I mentioned, I personally relate to what uh, his team is doing. And then I really appreciate the time and effort that they put to push this uh, 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 research area forward. Uh, he is one of the world leading researchers in, in the area of liver transplantation. And then it's amazing to see how great his team is uh, doing in terms of making sure that this technology is safe and it's getting closer to, uh, to, uh, to clinical applications. Uh, uh, and hope that we, uh, hopefully soon, we will hear uh, many, many good uh, things from uh, from uh, Morphocell Technologies and Paganelli's lab at University of Montreal. Uh, we are looking forward to uh, to more innovations uh, in the in the future. Uh, thank you. Also, I would like to thank all the participants for your patience today. Uh, we had some technical difficulties but uh, we'll try to work on it and then fix it for the uh, future, uh, future talks. So with that, I would like to end this, um, uh, this talk and then I'll see you next week. Take care.